Hello, welcome back to the History Sphere. What you're about to hear is part three of a three-part episode on the Creole Fair. If you have not yet listened to the first two episodes, I suggest you go back and do that now. Otherwise, you're going to be missing all of the context. On March 21, 1842, Representative Joshua Reed Giddings of Ohio rose on the floor of the House of Representatives to introduce a list of nine resolutions. 1. Prior to the Constitution, the states had full jurisdiction over slavery within their territory. 2. By adopting the Constitution, none of those powers were delegated to the federal government but were reserved by the states. The wording of these first two resolutions echoed language that was used in the pro-slavery positions and speeches and resolutions of John C. Calhoun, the leader of the extreme pro-slavery Democrats in the Senate. It said that at this point, after hearing these first two resolutions, some Southern representatives began tapping their canes in approval of the resolution, apparently unaware of what was coming next. Three. The Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, provides that the states surrendered jurisdiction over commerce and navigation on the high seas. This goes back to what we talked about in one of the previous episodes, concurrent sovereignty in the United States, where when they signed on to the Constitution, states surrendered some powers to the federal government, but retained others for themselves. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution says that Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states. This has been interpreted to mean that Congress and the federal government have the sole authority to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states. 4. Slavery, being an abridgment of the natural rights of man, can only exist by force of positive municipal law. 5. When a ship belonging to citizens of a state leaves the territory and waters of that state and enters upon the high seas, persons on board cease to be subject to the slave laws of that state and are governed by the law of the United States. 6. When the Creole left the territorial jurisdiction of Virginia, the slave laws of Virginia ceased to have jurisdiction over the persons on board, and they became amenable only to the laws of the United States. You will recall from episode 1 that attempts by southern delegates to the Constitutional Convention to enshrine slavery into national federal law failed. Slavery was only protected at this time by state law. There were no federal laws on slavery, either protecting or abridging the right of holding slaves. And what Giddings was arguing in this resolution is that once the ship left the territorial waters of Virginia, where the law unequivocally, by his own admission, protected slavery, that law ceased to apply. And since the flag of the United States was flown on the ship on the high seas, only the laws of the United States and not the laws of the state of Virginia, applied on board that ship. And since none of those federal laws created or recognized the institution of slavery, there could be no such institution on board that ship on the high seas. And he continued, 7. The persons on board the Creole, in resuming their natural rights of personal liberty, violated no law of the United States, incurred no legal responsibility, and are justly liable to no punishment. 8. All attempts to re-enslave those persons are unauthorized by the Constitution and are incompatible with our national honor. And 9. All attempts to exert our national influence in favor of the coastwise slave trade or to place the nation in the attitude of maintaining a commerce in human beings are subversive of the rights and injurious to the feelings of the free states, are unauthorized by the Constitution, and are prejudicial to our national character. After he finished, 
Few people were still tapping their canes in approval. The resolutions he had introduced threatened not only the coastwise slave trade, and therefore, in the minds of the southern slaveocracy, the institution of slavery itself, but also the delicate balance carefully maintained by both parties in Congress to avoid dividing the country over the issue of slavery. Giddings had violated the infamous gag rule. It was a parliamentary rule in the House of Representatives at this time that prohibited any member from introducing any anti-slavery legislation or resolutions on the House floor. The idea being that since Congress had no authority to limit, abolish, or abridge the rights of slaveholders in the slaveholding states, that to allow time on the floor to introduce such laws and resolutions was a waste of everybody's time and should be prohibited. In reality, I think it was meant to stifle debate and stifle speech and prevent a provocateur like Giddings from upsetting this delicate balance of national unity by ignoring the issue of slavery. Giddings knowingly violated this gag rule and introduced this anti-slavery resolution on the floor of the House of Representatives. Giddings was an abolitionist. He was a member of a small group of abolitionist representatives in Congress, led by Massachusetts representative and former president of the United States, John Quincy Adams. Born in Pennsylvania in 1795, Giddings had moved west with his family to northeastern Ohio as a child. He was a veteran of the War of 1812. After the war, he was admitted to the Ohio Bar as an attorney in 1821. He built a successful law practice with his partner and future U.S. Senator Benjamin Wade in Ashtabula, Ohio. He and Wade co-founded the local anti-slavery society together. Elected to Congress in 1838 on a staunch abolitionist platform, promising his constituency to do everything in his power to oppose slavery, Giddings had a mandate from the people of his district to fight against the institution of slavery. And he did do everything in his power to do this, including with this resolution that he introduced regarding the Creole affair. The House did not take up his resolutions for a vote. Instead, they formally censured Joshua Giddings. Censure being a, an official reprimand or an official expression of disapproval by his fellow congressmen. When someone is censured in Congress, there are no official consequences. They're not removed from office. They're not punished in any way. But it is supposed to be an expression of extreme dishonor. And in the 19th century, the political elite was obsessed with ideas of honor, a personal honor, and to be censured, to be formally disapproved of by your fellow representatives was seen as extremely dishonorable. The censure motion had been introduced by Representative John M. Botts, a Whig from Virginia. Botts is an interesting figure in his own right, and I can't resist going on a small tangent to talk about him. He was likely chosen to introduce this motion because of his decidedly moderate views and his reputation for moderation in the House of Representatives. He was a Whig who supported national investment in infrastructure, but opposed a centralized banking system, which most Whigs supported. Though he was a Southerner and a slave owner, he was known to sympathize with the anti-slavery movement. He opposed the expansion of slavery into new states and territories. He had openly denounced John C. Calhoun's defenses of slavery. He felt they sowed division and exacerbated a sectional divide in the United States. He had joined with anti-slavery and abolitionist representatives to oppose the gag rule, under which he now censured Representative Giddings because he felt it violated the free speech clause of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Later on, in the run-up to the United States Civil War, he was among the leaders of the Unionist opposition to Virginia's secession. He was jailed by the Confederate government in 1862 without trial for continuing to publish pro-Unionist articles and pamphlets. He is an example of the complicated, nuanced views on Union and slavery held by many moderates in the Upper South in states like Virginia. The censure motion passed by a vote of 125 to 69. 
Giddings was not given an opportunity to speak in his own defense. Giddings became only the second representative in the history of the House of Representatives to be censured. After being censured, he felt it was his duty to resign his seat and submit himself to the judgment of his constituents in Ohio. He stood in the special election on May 5, 1842, where his constituents overwhelmingly re-elected him to the seat by a 90-point margin. The stand made by Giddings in Congress came at a time when the rhetoric from the pro-slavery side was becoming increasingly heated due to the escalating Creole affair. On December 22, 1841, Senator Alexander Barrow of Louisiana rose to say that the subject of the Creole, quote, involved the question of peace or war between this country and Great Britain, and that it was important to settle whether the British government had a right to do what they who lived in the South denied to their own government, and that was the right of suppressing the slave trade between the states. Alabama Senator William King rose immediately after and stated that, quote, the time is not far off when the question of war must inevitably arise. Senator John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, the leader of the extreme pro-slavery Democrats and former two-time vice president of the United States, stated that the British actions regarding the Creole were, quote, the most atrocious outrage ever perpetrated on the American people. On January 29, 1842, Secretary of State Daniel Webster dispatched a formal communication to his counterpart in London. Webster stated, and I'm paraphrasing here, The slaves on the Creole were the lawful property of United States citizens. The arrival of the Creole in Nassau was not voluntary. The ship did not voluntarily avail themselves of the protection of British laws, and therefore British laws against slavery should not have been applied. The British authorities in Nassau had a plain and obvious duty to assist the crew of the Creole to resume their voyage and bring the, quote, murderers to justice in the United States. Rather than do their duty, they did the other thing. They interfered in the crew's ability to resume their voyage and confiscated the property of American citizens. In this, he was probably trying to give the higher-ups in the British government an out. He was giving them an opportunity to place the blame on incompetent local officials and to disavow the actions of Governor Coburn and other British officials in the Bahamas and thereby repair the relationship with the United States by passing the buck and blaming local officials. He claimed that the British had no authority to inspect the cargo or even inquire about the cargo of the Creole in the first place, as there was no declared intention by the crew to import any goods into British territory. He compared those enslaved on the Creole to British opium, asking whether American authorities would have the right to destroy a cargo of British opium that inadvertently made its way into an American port. Finally, he addressed the question of war and peace. He expressed that the United States strongly desired to maintain peace with the United Kingdom. However, until the core issues of how to handle things such as this Creole dispute were resolved definitively, he said, quote, the peace of the world will always be in danger, end quote. In London, the response of the British government was twofold, legal and diplomatic. On the legal side, the British government had to decide what was to be done with the 19 captives, the accused mutineers, the accused murderers, who were currently languishing in the local Nassau jail. To this end, the case was referred to the Doctors' Commons. The Doctors' Commons was a council of British legal scholars that was formed to advise the British government on important legal questions, especially those relating to admiralty law, that is, the law of the sea. Within three weeks of receiving the news of the Creole dispute, the council issued an advisory opinion answering the questions posed to it by the government. First, they said that the British courts in the Bahamas had no jurisdiction to charge the captives with the murder of John Hewell. They stated that the crime took place on the high seas on an American ship flying the American flag. Thus, only American courts could have jurisdiction over the matter. No rule of British law or international law could allow a British court to try anyone 
for violating criminal laws in the United States. Second, they said there is no general practice in international law requiring nations to extradite accused criminals. In saying there was no general practice, the council was referring to what we today call customary international law. Customary international law are unwritten rules of international law. And we figure out what these rules are by looking at two things. First, is there a widespread and consistent state practice of abiding by this custom or this behavior? Is it something that most or all states do in the ordinary course of business? And second, they look for a legal concept that we call opinio juris. And that is a subjective belief that in doing this behavior, states are acting according to their legal obligations. What the Council of Doctors was saying here is that there was no rule of customary international law that required the British to turn over suspected criminals to United States authorities. And they added that the British government cannot surrender them voluntarily if they have violated no British law, as there was no authority at that point to seize their liberty and hold them if they were not suspected or accused of violating any law of the British Empire. Third, they said that while extradition could sometimes be provided for by bilateral treaty between nations, no such treaty existed between the United States and the United Kingdom at this time. Fourth, they said that the only cognizable crime for which British courts in the Bahamas could have jurisdiction to try the captives was for the crime of piracy, because international law provides for universal jurisdiction to prosecute the crime of piracy. What they're talking about here is a rule of customary international law that has since been adopted by multiple international conventions, multilateral conventions. At the time, it was a rule of customary international law that holds pirates to be hostis humanae generis. That is my bad Latin pronunciation, meaning the common enemy of mankind. And thus, an act of piracy anywhere can be prosecuted by any nation in any court in the world. However, the council strongly opined that they did not believe a charge of piracy could be sustained. For the seizure of a ship and its cargo on the high seas to constitute piracy, the law required proof that the object of the act be to obtain plunder or booty. The council said that the Creole rebels had no desire for plunder or booty, but merely for their own freedom and their own liberty. And thus, this act did not, in their minds, constitute an act of piracy. Meanwhile, on the diplomatic front, the British government was considerably more conciliatory towards the Americans. On Christmas Eve 1841, immediately after being briefed on the Creole situation, Prime Minister Robert Peel sought an audience with Queen Victoria. He informed Queen Victoria that unless extraordinary diplomatic measures were taken, a third war with the United States was imminent. He asked her to appoint a special envoy to Washington, a request which was quickly approved by Queen Victoria. The envoy chosen was Alexander Baring, First Lord Ashburton. I love these British titles. Lord Ashburton was a wealthy banker and one of the partners in the firm of Baring Brothers, which at the time was one of the world's largest financial institutions. There were a lot of reasons that he was well-suited to this position as a figure that would be seen as conciliatory towards the Americans. First, he had large land holdings and financial investments in the United States. He was married to an American woman, Anne Louisa Bingham, the daughter of a former U.S. senator from Pennsylvania, William Bingham, for whom the town of Binghamton, New York, is named. He was personally acquainted with and had a good working relationship with Secretary of State Webster, who had previously served as an in-house counsel for the firm of Baring Brothers in the United States. Finally, he was a former slave owner. When the British government had finally abolished slavery in its Caribbean colonies in 1838, Lord Ashburton received compensation for approximately 500 slaves owned across three plantations in St. Kitts and Guyana. That's a lot of slaves. We're talking more than twice the number of slaves owned at any one time by George Washington, 
who by American standards was a major slaveholder. The appointment of Ashburton as special envoy did a lot to cool tempers when news reached the U.S. of his appointment in January. First of all, appointing a special envoy at all was seen as a sign that the British took the matter seriously and that they meant to negotiate in good faith. It was also taken as a sign that the mighty British Empire, which at this time was near the height of its power, viewed the United States as an equal partner in diplomacy. And finally, Ashburton was well known in America, at least among the political elites, and he was well liked. The British, however, still didn't really seem to understand how seriously the Americans, particularly American Southerners, took the Creole incident. Prior to his departure, Lord Ashburton was given a list of the disputes that he had authority to deal with, and they were listed in order of importance. Foreign Secretary Aberdeen believed that the interdiction of American ships off the coast of Africa would be the most important issue, followed by the dispute over the border between Canada and the state of Maine. The Creole incident was near the bottom of the list. It was almost an afterthought to Aberdeen. Whereas on the American side, this was seen as the most important and pressing issue. Ashburton arrived in the United States on April 2nd, 1842, and first met with Secretary of State Webster on April 4th to begin running through these various issues. Meanwhile, back in Nassau, the situation of the Creole rebels was quickly reaching its conclusion. In an attempt to show the U.S. Consul Bacon and the Americans, that he was making some effort to be conciliatory and address their concerns. On April 16th, Governor Coburn formally accused the remaining 17 captives in the Nassau jail of piracy. Two had died in the jail since they were first incarcerated there in November. One, George Grandy, died from wounds he had received during the uprising on board the Creole, and another, Adam Carney, died from an unknown illness in the jail. In the hearing on April 17th, the court found a lack of sufficient evidence to sustain the charge of piracy, and the charges were dismissed without the need for a trial. The chief judge of the court addressed the Creole rebels, telling them, quote, It has pleased God to set you free from the bonds of slavery. May you hereafter lead the lives of good and faithful subjects of Her Majesty's government, end quote. We don't know precisely what happened to all 17 of these men after they were set free from the Nassau jail. Madison Washington completely disappears from the historical record at this point. He walked out of the jail and out of the history books. Professor Jeffrey R. Kerr Ritchie, and I I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, Professor Kerr Ritchie, who is a professor of history at Howard University, has done extensive research on this topic which suggests, in short, that they settled in the Bahamas. Most of them stayed on or near New Providence Island. A few of them settled further afield in the Bahamas archipelago. We do know that Elijah Morris, the young man who had initiated the revolt by leading Gifford and Hewell into a trap and signaled the start by firing the pistol he had smuggled on board and grazing first mate Gifford in the back of the head with a bullet, settled in the village of Gambier just outside Nassau on New Providence Island. Gambier was founded as a settlement of West Africans liberated by the Royal Navy from illegal slave ships in the Atlantic. Its architecture and its local culture reflects a distinctly West African character to this day. Morris married and fathered three children, two sons, Alexander and Elijah Jr., and one daughter, Christiana. He purchased three adjacent five-acre plots of land in the village in 1859, 1864, and 1879. His son Alexander would sell this land in 1923. According to the Bahamian Ministry of Tourism, Morris's descendants still reside in Gambier today. Other descendants of Morris appear to have returned to the United States, but their exact whereabouts are unknown. The rebels having now obtained their goal and been freed from the bonds of slavery, now fade from this story. The story of uprising and revolt and slavery gives way to the negotiations and deliberations of lawyers and diplomats.
News of the liberation of the Creole rebels reached Washington, D.C. in early May 1842. By this time, the negotiations between Secretary of State Webster and Lord Ashburton were well underway. The ongoing negotiations between these two men seemed to change the perception of the event and to cool tempers somewhat. People didn't really freak out when they learned that the Creole rebels had been set free, though it was vehemently protested by many in the United States. There don't seem to have been any more high-profile calls for war with the United Kingdom. The existence of these ongoing negotiations between Webster and Ashburton seem to indicate an attitude of detente and de-escalation by both sides, even in the face of the rebels being set free. The main American concern at this point shifted from the actual recovery of their slave property to securing a future guarantee against such an incident ever happening again. This concern by the Americans presented several complications for the British. First, the British public and government at this time, as we discussed in the previous episodes, was vehemently anti-slavery. The British public and the British government did not approve of the institution of slavery, and they saw themselves as having been divinely appointed to fight against the evil of slavery. The British would not and could not sign any treaty which promised to return anyone who had arrived on their shores to slavery. It was a political impossibility. Ashburton, following instructions from London, was firm on this point. Any enslaved person who arrived in British territory, whatever the circumstances, came under the protection of British law and ceased to be enslaved. Ashburton did express, on the other hand, a willingness to secure extradition of persons accused of certain crimes back to the United States from British territory. In essence, he could sign a treaty that stipulated future perpetrators of slave rebellion could be extradited to the United States, not to be returned to slavery per se, but to face justice for murder, mutiny, or other crimes to be specified in the treaty. This concession was ultimately acceptable to Webster. The question is whether it would be acceptable to senators from southern states who would ultimately have the job of choosing whether or not to ratify any treaty. On August 9, 1842, Secretary of State Webster and Lord Ashburton signed the Treaty of Washington, which is colloquially known as the Webster-Ashburton Treaty. The treaty accomplished three things that secured a lasting peace between the United States and the United Kingdom. First, it settled all outstanding boundary disputes along the U.S.-Canada border, including along the Great Lakes and the border between Canada and the state of Maine. Second, it provided for cooperation between the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy in combating the illegal slave trade off the coast of West Africa, and it actually formed the first joint U.S.-U.K. Allied Military Operation, which was the Joint West Africa Squadron, which was a squadron of U.S. and Royal Navy ships that worked together to stem the flow of the illegal slave trade off the coast of West Africa. Third, and most importantly for our story, it provided for the future extradition of fugitives wanted for the crimes of murder, assault with intent to commit murder, piracy, arson, robbery, and forgery. While the crimes that were extraditable in the treaty did not include slave revolt or mutiny, the crimes covered were broad enough that they could have been invoked to secure the return of the Creole rebels. That was good enough for Webster. Webster was a Yankee boy from Massachusetts. The question is, would this be good enough for the pro-slavery southern senators who would decide whether or not to ratify this treaty in the Senate? The treaty did not directly address the Creole affair. Webster and Ashburton, they were ambiguous in talking about slavery and slave uprising. They didn't directly address these issues. They used something that would later be a term coined by Henry Kissinger. It wasn't yet in use at this time, but the the strategy was in use. Something called constructive ambiguity. That they moved toward a detente and an agreement between both sides, specifically by not stating the real issue that was at stake. 
and they felt that they came to a sufficient compromise in agreeing for extradition for these crimes, which could plausibly be included within any future slave uprising or insurrection, but that did not directly address the issue at stake, so as not to flare tempers on either side, either the pro-slavery tempers in America or the anti-slavery tempers in the United Kingdom. Because it did not directly address the rights of slaveholders or actions to be taken in the event of a slave uprising, there were fears by people in support of the treaty that it would be rejected in the Senate. Those fears were assuaged when John C. Calhoun, the leader of the extreme pro-slavery wing of the Democratic Party, signaled that he would approve of the treaty. He signaled this approval and his intent to vote for ratification because he, he understood the constructive ambiguity. He was no dunce. While he was a pro-slavery extremist, he understood that the British had their own strong anti-slavery sentiments. He also understood that it was in the interest of both nations to put this behind them and resume productive commerce. He was pro-slavery because slavery benefited the economy of his home state and the southern states in general, which relied on exporting cotton. Who was the biggest buyer for slave-produced southern cotton? It was, somewhat hypocritically, the vehemently anti-slavery United Kingdom. Slave-produced American cotton at this time was fueling the Industrial Revolution in Britain. Textile mills and factories in Britain were fueled by cotton and other goods produced by American slaves, and so the British industrial system and the American slave system were dependent on one another, and both sides understood this, and Senator Calhoun certainly understood this. And so he signaled his assent to the treaty to bring the pro other pro-slavery senators into line to support the treaty and put this issue behind both countries and resume productive commerce and trade which benefited the slaveholding states. The pro-slavery Democrats fell into line behind Senator Calhoun, and the treaty was ratified by the Senate by a vote of 39 to 9. The treaty marked the high point and the greatest achievement of the presidency of John Tyler and his relationship with Secretary of State Webster. Webster would resign from Tyler's cabinet the following year in 1843 over a disagreement with Tyler's push to annex Texas and thereby add another slave state to the Union. Webster would return to the U.S. Senate representing Massachusetts from 1845 to 1850. He would briefly serve again as Secretary of State in the administration of Millard Fillmore before passing away in 1852. In his last act as president, John Tyler would sign into law the annexation of Texas, arguably initiating a series of events that would lead to the country's final rupture over the spread of slavery and cause the Civil War. Tyler would taint his legacy by siding with the Confederacy in the Civil War. He would die in 1862 after being elected as a representative from Virginia to the Confederate Congress. He is the only former president whose coffin was not draped in an American flag and whose death went unmarked by the sitting president, Abraham Lincoln. With the role of diplomats now over, the Creole dispute became one of lawyers and courtrooms. There was an insurance case stretching from December 1841 all the way into 1845. Beginning on December 8, 1841, seven different owners of people who had been enslaved on board the Creole brought claims against their insurance carriers who all refused to pay in the commercial court of the city of New Orleans. These cases were eventually coalesced into a single matter, McCargo versus the Merchants Insurance Company of New Orleans. The insurance policies in question all contain similar boilerplate language, stating that the slave owners were insured against, among other things, foreign interference. The policies explicitly did not insure against, quote, elopement, insurrection, or natural death, end quote. The idea being that these were all things that the owners and the carrier, when we refer to the carrier, we're talking about the ship owners, the ship's crew, the ship's captain, the people responsible for transporting the enslaved people from Richmond to New Orleans. 
the owners and the carrier had a duty to mitigate these risks by taking their own preventative measures and that the insurance company was not responsible for those things. And so the central question in this case became, was the quote-unquote property, the, the enslaved people, were they lost due to interference of British officials, or was the loss of property due to a preventable slave insurrection? The trial hinged on extensive testimony from first mate Zephaniah Gifford. As we discussed in the previous episode, Gifford had, I think, untruthfully and nonsensically testified that most of the enslaved on board the Creole really wanted to stay slaves. They wanted to stay on board and continue to New Orleans to be sold at the market, but they were only left the ship and became free because they were under, under pressure from British officials. Like I said, that part of his testimony wasn't really credible. Nobody at the time really believed it. Nobody believes it now. He was simply trying to cover for his employer and save his job. And crucially, on another front, under cross-examination by defense counsel, by the insurance company's lawyer, Gifford acknowledged that the loss of control of the ship following the revolt was complete and that the crew could not have reasserted control of the ship by any means from the rebels prior to their arrival in Nassau. The lead counsel for the insurance companies was one Judah P. Benjamin. Judah P. Benjamin is a terribly fascinating historical figure in his own right, and as you know, I love going off on tangents about interesting historical figures, so it's tangent time. Born on the Caribbean slave colony of St. Croix, then a Danish possession, to a Portuguese Sephardic Jewish family. Benjamin immigrated to the United States with his family when he was a child, and he grew up in North Carolina. After attending Yale College, he moved to New Orleans, studied law, and became a successful attorney. He invested the money he made from his law practice into a sugar plantation with 140 slaves, using his membership in the planter class to launch a political career. First, he was elected to the state legislature, and then as a U.S. senator from Louisiana from 1853 to 1861. He was the first Jewish person to serve in the United States Senate who had not renounced his faith. In 1861, he resigned his Senate seat and joined the Confederate government. He held three positions in Confederate government throughout the course of the Civil War. First as Attorney General, then as Secretary of War, and finally as Secretary of State. Following the defeat of the Confederacy in the Civil War, he fled the country and went into exile in England, where he became a barrister. In 1868, he would publish the seminal treatise on civil commercial law for common law practitioners. It still required reading for many British and American students of commercial law. During the trial, Benjamin would make two statements in arguing his case that would be reprinted in abolitionist publications across northern states, and that sounds somewhat ironic coming from the mouth of a man who owned 140 slaves. Such is sometimes the nature of the legal profession. I myself am a lawyer, and I can tell you that we are often, by the circumstances of a case and our duty to advocate for our clients, pressed into making statements and rhetorical arguments that we don't necessarily agree with, and that are sometimes contradictory. It's a strange profession. What can I say? In arguing that the carrier, that is the ship captain and crew, had a duty to treat the enslaved on board the ship as passengers, that is human beings, rather than cargo, and that their failure to do so constituted negligence and a breach of duty under the contract, he said, quote, Will this court be disposed to recognize one standard of humanity for the white man and another for the Negro? Will any reasonable man say that 135 Negroes would be as cheerful, contented, and indisposed to insurrection under such circumstances of discomfort as they would have been in a larger and more commodious vessel? End quote. And in his closing argument, he argued that it was not British intervention, but rather the non-existence of slave status in the Bahamas that had dispossessed the slave owners of their property. He said, quote, Slavery is against the law of nature, and although sanctioned as a local or municipal institution, 
of binding force within the limits of the nation that chooses to establish it, and on vessels of such nations on the high seas, but as having no force or binding effect beyond the jurisdiction of such nation. If this sounds familiar, it's because he was making a very similar argument to the argument made by the abolitionist representative Joshua Giddings, that outside of slavery being protected by a positive state law, it was the presumption that slavery did not exist as a natural law, that the natural and normal condition of all men, black or white, was freedom, and absent some positive local law establishing the condition of slavery, it was presumed that someone is not enslaved, and the presumption is always freedom. Benjamin's clients, the insurance companies, would lose this case at trial in the Commercial Court of New Orleans, with the court finding in favor of the plaintiffs, the slave owners. The court found that because the American crew could have reasserted control of the Creole and sailed away, but for the interference of British officials, foreign interference was the cause of the loss. Undeterred, Judah P. Benjamin appealed this ruling to the Supreme Court of the state of Louisiana. The Louisiana Supreme Court would reverse the trial court, finding that the cause of the loss was the insurrection, as British officials would never have been near the situation but for the insurrection of the enslaved men on board the Creole. The court relied on the trial testimony of Gifford, stating that the insurrection was immediately complete and irreversible by the crew, and that the crew would never reassert control over the ship. The property was irrevocably lost at this point, caused by not the interference of British officials, but by the insurrection itself. The insurance companies, therefore, were not required to pay for the loss of the slaves on board the Creole. The story is not yet complete. The final chapter of the story takes place in an international claims commission jointly established by the United States and the United Kingdom in 1853. Two commissioners were appointed to this claims commission, one American and one British. In the event of a disagreement between these two commissioners, a neutral umpire would be appointed to break the tie. The commission had authority to arbitrate all outstanding commercial disputes between U.S. and U.K. citizens against the government of the other between the end of the War of 1812, which somewhat ironically ended in 1815, not 1812, and the founding of the commission in 1853. The Creole slave owners, having lost their U.S. court case in the Supreme Court of Louisiana, brought their claim for compensation before this commission in London against the British government. Hearings were held on October 19th and 21st, 1854, and the commissioners predictably deadlocked on this issue, the American commissioner siding with the slave owners, the British commissioner siding with the British government, and so an umpire had to be appointed to break the tie. The umpire appointed to break the tie was a man named Joshua Bates. Bates took an oath of neutrality. Bates was an American who had been born in Massachusetts, a free state, but had spent most of his life living in England. He was business partners with Lord Ashburton at the London-based firm of Baring Brothers, the financial firm which we talked about before was one of the largest financial institutions in the world at this time. Bates broke the tie, finding in favor of the slave owners on January 9, 1855, more than 13 years after the revolt on board the Creole. Bates explained his decision, stating that slavery, while a violation of British law, was not a violation of international law, or what was called at the time the law of nations, as it was legal within the territory not just of the United States, but many nations still had slavery at this time, so there was no widespread and consistent state practice against slavery. It was not against international law. He went on to say that when a ship is on the high seas, the law of the flag nation applies on board that ship. That is, whichever flag the ship on the high seas is flying, the laws of that nation apply on board that ship. And if that nation's laws allow slavery, then slavery is a lawful condition on board that ship. 
He continued saying that when a ship is forced into a foreign harbor by forces outside the control of the ship's captain and crew, the ship has not voluntarily availed itself of the protection of the laws of the nation owning the harbor. And therefore, the nation that owns the harbor has no right to impose its laws on the ship and the law of the flag nation still applies on the ship within the harbor. He agreed with the British that the courts in the Bahamas had no jurisdiction to judge the alleged crimes committed on the Creole, but he disagreed saying that that didn't mean that they should set them free. Instead, he said what they should have done and what their duty was, was to help the captain and crew subdue the accused and transport them back to the United States, where justice could be administered in U.S. courts. He stated that British authorities had had no right to interfere with slavery, which was lawful under the laws of the flag nation, which applied on board the Creole, even within the Nassau Harbor. The commission ordered the British government to pay the slave owners $883 per lost slave. Now, at this time, this was only about half the actual value of the enslaved people, but it was more than these slave owners would get for any of their other slaves. Because ten years later, on December 6, 1865, in the aftermath of the U.S. Civil War, the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution would be ratified and would officially end the practice of race-based chattel slavery and, in theory, any other form of lawful slavery in the United States. Unlike in the United Kingdom, slave owners in the United States would not be compensated for the loss of their property. The institution of race-based chattel slavery would limp on in parts of the Western Hemisphere for two more decades until Brazil became the last nation to abolish it in 1888. And that is the story of the Creole Affair. The most important question to ask now is why does any of this matter? Why have I spent the last month of my life researching and talking to you about the Creole Affair? I think the Creole Affair is exemplary of the contradictions and moral quandaries inherent in the story of American slavery. I think that it's, it's an important vehicle for explaining the institution of slavery and the role of slavery in American history and world history. Slavery is fundamental to any understanding of the United States. If you want to understand the United States today, you have to understand the origins and the practice of slavery in the United States. If you don't understand slavery, you don't understand America. I don't say that because I'm one of these people that thinks America is irredeemably racist and evil. I actually don't believe that. I'm an American myself. I consider myself a patriot. I'm proud of my country. But I'm proud of my country because of the progress that we've made and the accomplishments that we've had toward achieving the ideals set forth in our Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal. And we w those achievements would mean nothing if our country had always been perfect. Understanding slavery and the debate and the role of slavery in American history is crucial. The debate over slavery, both pro-slavery and anti-slavery voices, defined the first 90 years of American history. Much of our subsequent history after the Civil War, even after slavery ended, has been defined by our reckoning or, at times, our failure to reckon with our history of slavery and racial oppression. If you want to understand where we are today with the modern debates over race and policing, critical race theory, the Black Lives Matter movement, all of the debates and ongoing disagreements that we have over race and racial oppression in this country. Whichever side of these debates you fall on, if you want to have an intelligent discussion about these issues, you have to understand them in the context of the origins of America's race issues. And the origin of the issue of race as a political issue in America stems from the history of of slavery and racial oppression. It's inescapable. They're inextricably linked. 
The Creole Affair, of course, doesn't just give us a window into slavery in the United States. So often, even when we do have discussions about slavery in the United States, that conversation is very narrow. We talk about things within the United States as though slavery was a purely domestic problem, as if it happened in a vacuum and didn't affect things happening on the world stage. As we've learned by listening to these three episodes on the Creole Affair, the USA was not the only country involved in the slave trade. They were not the only country enmeshed in a debate over the meaning of slavery and the meaning of property rights and the right to have property in man. It was an issue that weighed heavily in international as well as domestic political concerns and legal concerns. The story of slavery is also the story of law and justice, and it affects not only domestic law in the United States and in other countries, but it's a huge part of the story and the development of international law. And we talked about some of that here. The letters, that I didn't have time to address them in full, but you can find these letters and they're fascinating sources of international law. The letters exchanged between Secretary of State Webster and Lord Ashburton are still cited by international law scholars today to determine a number of issues with regard to the law of the sea, maritime law, maritime shipping law, as well as the law of armed conflict, their discussion over the Caroline Affair and the rules around self-defense. I was assigned to read these letters in my law of armed conflict class that I took in law school. And they are not only fascinating, but they are windows into the development of rules of international law that still apply to this day in the law between nations. Ultimately, in learning to understand the Creole affair narrowly and broadly the story of, of slavery and the debate over slavery in the United States and on the world stage, we learn to understand ourselves and the world that we live in. History is not just the story of the past. It's an explanation of the present. Thank you very much for bearing with me and listening to me talk about the Creole affair and about slavery. I'm very grateful to have had you along for this ride on this journey with me. When we return, I will be tackling an all-new subject and starting an all-new series in a very different time and place in the world. I look forward to telling you all about it next time on the History Sphere. As always, I would like to give a big thank you and shout out to the Blake Annex for providing me with the state-of-the-art studio that I am using to record this podcast. If you haven't already, please follow us on social media. The History Sphere podcast is now on Facebook, Instagram, and the platform formerly known as Twitter. Please follow us on social media for regular updates about the show. Please give us a five-star rating on whichever podcast platform you're listening to us on. That really helps to promote the show and help us get it established. Thank you all so much for being with me on this journey. I really appreciate you. Until next time, signing off. Thank you very much. Thank you.